von Mandelsloh, uh, who engraved, scratched his name on the gate of all lands. Uh, this was very hard to find, but uh, actually I could find it last summer. Um, here it is, Johann Albrecht von Mandelsloh, 1638. You have to trust me if you can't see actually the, the name. And uh, here's one left by Sir Halford Jones uh, on the gate of all lands. And Mandelsloh's graffiti, or name, is the oldest on the gate of all lands. Um, he visited um, the ruins at Persepolis, Nachri Rustam, and Pesargade. And let's look at some of his engravings. Here's uh, the picture he reproduced in his travel account. Uh, again, something that was made after in Europe based on his notes and uh, description of the site. Uh, we see horses here again, uh, maybe a Pegasus uh, or a Sphinx. Um, columns, yes and a sort of bridge-looking stairs or a ramp going to the top of the platform, stone platform, with angels and, you know, uh, figures all over the place. Um, and let's look at his uh, reproduction of the Tomb of Cyrus uh, at Pasargadi. Uh, this one is, is better than uh, the one from Persepolis in that he uh, records, recorded these columns around the tomb of Cyrus, but in a sort of, you know, um, I would say a European landscape with this gabled roof um, room or house, again like a European, contemporary European house of his time. Um, you would say this, 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 was in, this is in wood. Um, and uh, we know that this is not accurate because it was made again after, uh, based on his uh, note. Um, let's look at two more reliable uh, pictures of the tomb of Cyrus. Uh, the one that uh, was produced by Charles Texier, uh, a French traveler and a painter himself in 1840. Um, and the one that uh, was made by uh, John Oster in uh, 1860s. Uh, yes, we know that the tomb of Cyrus was here. Uh, there were steps in a gabled roof tomb chamber surrounded by a series of other ruins. Um, and this is the picture we have from Ernst Helsford in 1928 uh, that shows the tomb um, in its previous, uh, you know, uh, condition, the tomb of Cyrus was transformed into a mosque in um, in the 12th century, and uh, they carved the mihrab inside the tomb chamber here, and there was a cemetery attached to the mosque, um, 12th century mosque. Uh, let's stay in Pusargadi, uh for the moment and to look at some of the uh, pictures reproduced uh, from the famous winged genie or winged figure. Uh, we know that this jam was decorated with a winged figure surmounted by a trilingual inscription now gone. And this is good because um, on these two um, illustrations or engravings we can see the inscription with the name of Cyrus, trilingual inscription with the name of Cyrus that uh, disappeared between 1860 and 1875, the date of uh, this picture taken by uh, Friedrich Stolze. And this is how it looks now, uh, the famous winged figure of, of Pasargadi. Um, Um, in, uh, I would say, um, in, in the late years of the 17th century, we have um, more, um, I would say, more decent travelers 
the more accurate ones, um, like uh, this one, uh, Jean Chardin. Um, and I would uh, talk a little bit about Chardin and his, his really contribution to the study of uh, Persepolitan um, discoveries. Um, Chardin was a French uh, businessman, a jeweler, who traveled to Persia twice and who visited the ruins three times. Uh, between 1667 and 1674 uh, or 5. And uh, the third time he was at Persepolis, uh, he took a, a draftsman, a painter named Grelo, a famous uh, painter, uh, with whom he quarreled. And uh, Grelo left him uh, to work for another uh, traveler at that time. Uh, so in his travel accounts in French, they were translated into Persian or uh, English, um, he talks in detail about uh, the ruins, probably the, the first thorough description of the ruins uh, is published in Chardin's uh, travel account. He talks about uh, the subterranean drainage system of Persepolis uh, that he explored in part. He talks about uh, cuneiform inscriptions. He even copied some of the cuneiform inscriptions. Uh, and uh, he's the one who reproduced the first panoramic, more or less accurate, uh, uh, views of Persepolis we have, uh, especially in, in the last uh, edition of his book in 1810. Uh, as we can see here, it's a here we have two views of Chardin by Grelo, um, two panoramic views of Persepolis, uh, the terrace of Persepolis with this uh, monumental staircase, the gate of all lands, uh, the multitude of columns here. He got the, the position of this structure quite right outside the platform. And another view taken from uh, the slope of the mountain uh, with the palaces on top of the stone platform, uh, the Kemenid structure outside the platform, and maybe the prehistoric mounds of Tal al um, I don't know if Dr. Ali Zadeh is with us tonight. Um, so um, maybe an early view of Tal al uh, ever reproduced in uh, those uh, travel accounts of the 17th century. Uh, I also uh, talked about um, Chardin's copies of um, cuneiform inscriptions, like the, these um, trilingual window inscriptions in the palace of Darius, which he copied, uh, actually Grelo, uh, the painting, uh, his uh, draftsman and painter. Um, here's one um, published in uh, a Venetian, um, by a Venetian traveler who hired uh, Grelo, actually who stole Grelo from Chardin. Anyway, uh, the next um, series of images and illustrations were produced uh, by this, uh, I would say, uh, trained uh, painter, Dutch painter, uh, Cornelis de Bruyne, yeah, who criticizes, uh, you know, uh, Chardin's and uh, uh, Mandelslow's uh, views of Persepolis, and he says that, oh, they are not accurate, uh, mine are uh, far better. Indeed, uh, his engravings were far better because he was a trained painter. And we have uh, much better views of Persepolis uh, with more details um, um, reproduced in De Bruyne's uh, travel account uh, in 1704. Another, uh, another view, panoramic view of uh, De Bruyne in his uh, travel account. And he scratched his name on the gate of uh, all lands with his companion Anton de Becker and Cornelis de Bruyne 
1704. Um, he also um, took the liberty of removing some of the sculptures. Um, here is an instance, and he, he talks in detail. He writes in detail about uh, you know, uh, that task that uh, he didn't have uh, you know, uh, good tools, uh, chisels, uh, for example, to remove the, uh, one of the reliefs. And um, finally, he, he found uh, some people um, in Isfahan, and then uh, they, uh, they did the job for him. He took the reliefs with him to, to Holland uh, to study, and then uh, sold them to, uh, um, to a dealer in Holland. And some of them ended up in, in the museum in Amsterdam. That is, they're, they're not lost. Uh, they're safe. Um, and then um, we have um, a sort of album, uh, a photo album, I would say, an engraving album uh, named Persepolis Illustrata, whose author is unknown. Uh, but we, um, we think that this was done either by a Dutch or a French trained artist uh, in those years, 1739. Uh, really, um, it was published in 1739, but it couldn't be produced or made in 1739 because the Safavid Empire um, collapsed with the capture of Isfahan in 1724. So these were made or had been made before uh, that date. Again, a panoramic view of the site of Persepolis, the platform, including this small structure. And I would like to talk uh, a little bit about this structure. Um, um, this is this is structure. Um, we know that uh, none of these big columned halls uh, were appropriate or suitable for, for living, you know. Uh, in the Achaemenid period. Uh, and uh, we think that uh, the king and his entourage uh, would stay in, in the whereabouts of the site when, at the time when uh, most of these palatial complexes were in the process of construction. Uh, the largest palace ever discovered outside the platform is this four-column palace. and. And this is what you have here. And when this, um, at the time when this engraving was, was made or produced, uh, one of the columns was still standing there. Um, and apropos this, this palace, which was later excavated by Ali Asami and uh, Akbar Tajwidi in the 1960s and 70s, Robert Kerr Porter, the famous Robert Kerr Porter, British traveler, um, I wrote a few lines, and I would uh, like to read those lines. Well, uh, I cannot uh, do justice to his uh, romantic uh, style with my accent, but I'll do my best. Caporter reports on what he could be seen outside the platform, and it's interesting to compare his description with uh, the views uh, by Chardin and uh, De Bruyne. He writes, the second object is to be the southwest of the platform and consists of a heap of beautiful fragments, apparently the ruins of a temple or some structure of architecture consequence, which the views of Chardin and Lebrun have distinguished by a noble and solitary column standing up from amidst its fallen companions like a hero over his mighty dead. But it is now led beside them, and long grass alone waves its green banner above the prostrate pillars of greatness. The last stroke which I leveled, which leveled this beautiful relique was struck about 15 years ago 